Hello there. Welcome to the week ahead. But first, the weekends with a super solid U.S. jobs report, with the U.S. economy adding 287,000 jobs in June, much higher than the 180,000 expected, and far beyond the dismal 38,000 that we had in May, making it the biggest jump in payrolls in eight months. A much-needed piece of positive data for the markets after two weeks of turmoil, really. Now, next week we focus on the Bank of England's interest rate decision and much more. So let's go on Monday. We've got Japan's machinery orders. Italian industrial production and the U.S. Fed labor market conditions index. On Tuesday, we kick off with Germany, the consumer price index, U.S. Red Book wholesales inventories and the OPEC oil market report. On Wednesday, Australia, Westpac consumer confidence, China trade balance, Japan industrial production, France inflation rate, Eurozone industrial production, U.S. import and export prices, got the beige book as well and those oil inventories as well as the Bank of Canada interest rate decision. On Thursday, we have Bastille Day. We've got Australia's our business confidence, unemployment as well. And this is the crucial one, which we will discuss. It's the Bank of England interest rate decision. U.S. initial jobless claims as well on Thursday. On Friday, we begin in China with the growth rate, the GDP, as well as industrial production and retail sales. U.K. construction output, Eurozone trade balance, there's an inflation report too. U.S. inflation, retail sales and industrial production and those business inventories. But as I say, on Thursday, we are going to talk about the Bank of England because what a week it's been. We've got uh, Chris Beecham here. Hello to you. My word, what are we expecting? Because we are actually expecting something. It makes a change to be talking about something from the Bank of England. Uh, but given what we've had in the UK economy in the past two weeks, it's not surprising to think we might actually see maybe even a cut in interest rates this early. Mark Carney has certainly prepared the markets and uh, observers generally for some sort of move from his pronouncements. He's been the one stable voice in the UK since uh, the vote for Brexit two weeks uh, ago. He's been very saying, vocal, hasn't he, about it? Yes, I think it's good. It's what we need to have that sort of confidence, uh, sort of calm approach thing. Someone described him as the only adult in the room at the moment. They may cut rates this early on. Certainly he's prepared the MPC to do that. It would be very odd if they didn't follow the line of their leader, although obviously they are uh, independent um, economists from their own standpoint. But I think we are looking at an environment where looser policy is to be expected for the UK, which means the pound is likely to continue to decline against the dollar, against the euro. That's been very much in vogue this week. Um, and the question is, what can the Bank of England do beyond that, of course? Interest rates already at 0.5%. So there's not much room on the downside to keep cutting. And we know from experience with Bank of Japan, from the ECB and from others, that negative rates don't really work, at least not at the moment. So the room for manoeuvre is slightly limited, but it would be very interesting to see what the MPC statement and the minutes that go along with it really reveal about their thinking uh, for the next few months. Because while we don't have a PM and we don't have an official government really, well, we do have a government but not one uh, completely devoted to action, I think the key thing is to watch what the Bank of England says and to watch what they might do in the coming months to really keep the economy ticking over. And also the sterling as well, because it's still loitering around that 30-year low. Oh, yes, we can see further weakness for sterling, really. It's, the jury is still firmly out on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing for the UK economy. Uh, it certainly has helped the FTSE 100. Um, does it continue to bounce or does it continue to fall lower? The question really is not where it ends up. The question is how it gets there. And I think if it continues to move in a relatively orderly fashion, which after the initial shock of Brexit it has done, then the market will continue to adjust over the longer term. Some investment banks say we could see it down towards 115 against the US dollar by the end of the year. And even parity is now being talked about. But I think we should worry about the path of the currency um, rather than the actual end point itself. OK. And next week is also busy for house builders. We know this is a very delicate industry at the moment post-Brexit. And also the sterling plays into this as well. Yeah, so we'll see how really that affects the broader UK economy. I think the bigger question is really how uh, the FX movements inter interact with the euro, with the US dollar, and certainly even with today's strong NFP reading, we don't expect the Fed to raise rates this year. I think we can fairly say that's not a given, but looking highly likely that they leave policy uh, unchanged. So that's also really uh, how things feed in at the moment. We've also got some Chinese data during the week, so that will be interesting, and then further US numbers as well. So there's more, I think, just to keep things ticking over as we try to shift our focus away from Brexit slightly with the understanding that really everything comes back to that at the moment. Because mm. at one point, China was the centre, the epicentre of it all. It's changed somewhat. It's actually been rather quiet from yeah. China. It has been a much quieter period. We have seen yuan devaluation over the last few weeks and really no one's paid any attention to it. And I think that's really a sense that it doesn't really matter at the moment what the Chinese currency does. We're sort of adjusting to that world as well. So clearly the market is 
we can only focus on one thing at once at the moment at, the, at any given time and I think Brexit is the key thing. China still lingers in the background on what the Fed does but at the moment everything comes back to Brexit. Absolutely. All right let's move on because we've got corporate news and we get set for the second earnings season for this year which takes the spotlight with Monday's Alcoa report and releases from a whole host of major banks as well later on in the week. We've got retailers, home builders and recruiters but as I say we do indeed have Alcoa there kicking it all off at the beginning and we also have recruiters out in force as well. Hiring is an issue, especially in the banking sector as well. On Tuesday, house builder uh, Galliford Trine, there's a concern in the industry that non-residential construction will face pressure as the economy slows. We've got ASOS as well. Uh, they said that a drop in the value of the sterling will bring opportunity for the group because 60% of their sales come from abroad. Uh, again, recruiter page group as well, taking a bit of a beating as well. There's a concern about fewer EU workers coming Coming across the channel, Premier Oil too. It's had a rise of about 50% so far this year, and Johnson and Johnson as well. On Wednesday, we have the uh, tech giant Fenner, fashion, British fashion label Burberry as well. Emerging market growth is a challenge for this one. ICAP as well, the market's operator, and Barrett's Developments again, another property developer. Uh, JD Weatherspoons, um, the founder actually, a huge Brexiteer, I should say, has lost 18.8 million pounds from his personal share in the pub since then, even though he was a Brexiteer. Um, okay, packaging group as well, RPC, American Airline there, US tech giant Intel, and we've got Yum Brands as well. That deals with KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, lots in there, lots of healthy things, not. And French construction as well, also on the list. Thursday, again, we have another clothing retailer, Supergroup, is coming in. Another recruiter, Hayes as well, and Ashmore, the investor. Halford Cycling and Motor Parts there, baby goods from Mother Care, Financial Services, Experian, and uh, we've also got Workspace as well. It does what it says on the tin. And lots of banking from the US next week. We've got JP Morgan, BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, and uh, AMD as well, another tech firm. Again, financials on Friday, because we're going to finish up with some huge huge uh, corporations there, Wells Fargo on the list, Citigroup as well, and US Bancorp. Chris is still with us to talk this through. So a lot of US financials reporting next week, Chris. Yeah, US earnings season kicks off in style, of course. Alcoa, uh, the traditional beginning we get on Monday, but really it doesn't really move into higher gear until we get the US banks coming later in the week. And that will be really the interesting to, thing to keep an eye on because these are banks, or well, a lot of them, are clearly exposed to the international situation and Brexit again is high on uh, the list of concerns. The analysts this week saying they can expect quite a big hit for US banks, now especially those with big operations in the UK. So you're looking at the likes of Citigroup, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs all coming through this week. Not as much Wells Fargo because that's very much a US uh, focused bank. So that might continue to do the best out of the sector, but definitely uh, we want to see really what the short-term impact is from Brexit, whether they consider moving in their operations, what they see for their business divisions, for their key uh, rainmakers, if you like, as well. So there's a lot to be gleaned this week, I think, from US banks and how they view the global economy over the coming months. It's almost, I think, as important as what the Bank of England says in its economic report on Thursday. OK, considering how interconnected it is. In terms of the corporate world, it's very um, eclectic next week. We've got an array. We've got retailers, recruiters, um, lots of fashion groups as well. What have you got your eye on? What do you think is going to move the markets particularly? Well, I suppose uh, taking together those fashion groups, ASOS and Burberry will be interesting on the different ends of the spectrum, of course. Burberry, crucial because we've got further China data as well, as well as that GDP from China. We've got retail sales as well on the calendar for next week. So Burberry, another key one for how it views its performance in China. Doubtless, of course, the fall in sterling will be uh, a key topic in their earnings report as well, because that's come through this week as well. Uh, a couple of firms this week have said actually a falling pound could be a good thing for revenue, so we might see an improvement in earnings. So Burberry, a key one to watch there. ASOS, the other end of the spectrum, what happens with UK consumers? Because John Lewis warning today about a confidence hit, about a spend, hit to spending as well. Maybe that will be seen in ASOS as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously Mark Carney, he spoke about consumer confidence as well, didn't he? Exactly. So that's, I think it's the worry at the moment is really where do UK consumers see the next few months and will they rein in their spending? It seems quite likely, I think. And if you take into account also house builders this week, we've got away without any profit warnings from the sector so far. Persimmon and Bovis, both fairly upbeat this week. We'll see if the trend is repeated in the coming week. OK. And obviously for those fashion houses, if they're UK based, it's all about the weather, actually. 
a big component. All right, thank you very much indeed. That's Chris Beecham there talking us through it all. And there really is never a dull moment, is there, when it comes to the markets in this post-EU referendum era. And we will be keeping you up to date throughout the week here on IGTV. So stay tuned and we'll keep you on top of it all. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.